be silence, no videos, no photos. Uh, just a reminder.
Thank you. Please be seated. All right, before we get started, uh, I'm going to review one thing for the audience here today. Uh, regarding disruptive behavior. Any activity or behavior which is considered disruptive by the court will result in removal from the courtroom. Any spectator who creates a visual or auditory disturbance of the court proceedings may be removed from the courtroom and or the building at any time at the discretion of me or court security. We'll now call the case Madison County Magistrate Division of the District Court CR 3320-302 State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Counsel for Ms. Vallow appears at the defense table. We have uh, Ms. Elcox, Mr. Webb, and Mr. Means. Uh, counsel for the state is Mr. Wood and Mr. Rammel. This is the date and time set for an initial appearance. The defendant is also present here in the courtroom. Counsel for defense, um, in the court pleadings, it designates Ms. Vallow, AKA Ms. Daybell. How would your client like to be referred to by the court? Mrs. Daybell, please, Your Honor. All right. Ms. Daybell, do you read, speak, and understand the English language? Yes. Ms. Daybell, did you fill out a notification of rights form with your counsel prior to the hearing here today? Do you understand your legal rights here today? Yes. Do you have any questions about the form that you've filled out or your rights? No. All right, we'll proceed forward then. Ms. Uh, Daybell, it's my understanding that you've hired these three attorneys that are with you here today, and that's your position that you'd like to retain your own private counsel. Is that correct? Yes. Did you get a copy of the criminal complaint as well as the arrest warrant that has been issued in this matter? Yes. Ms. Daybell, I can read the, uh, the criminal complaint in its entirety or we can summarize it going through each of the charges. Which would you prefer? We will waive a formal reading, Your Honor. Okay. We'll just go through the counts then, one by one, as well as the penalties. Uh, this criminal complaint was filed here in Madison County on February 18th, 2020. Uh, it is State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow, a.k.a. Lori Noreen Daybell. It charges the defendant with five different counts. The first count is desertion and non-support of children or spouse. That count is a felony under Idaho law, Idaho Code 18-401, Section 1. The punishment is up to a four-year maximum imprisonment in the state penitentiary and or up to a $500 fine. It designates or alleges that the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, a.k.a. Lori Noreen Daybell, on or between the 23rd of September 2019 and the 18th day of February 2020 in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did desert a child under the age of 18 to wit JV, date of birth 52512, who was dependent upon the defendant for care, education, or support with the intent to abandon JV. Ms. Daybell, do you understand what count one alleges as well as the maximum penalties? Yes. Under count two, it is that same charge, desertion and non-support of children or spouse. It's also a felony under Idaho Code 18401, subsection one. It is punishable by up to 14 years in the state penitentiary and up to and or up to a $500 fine. It alleges that the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, AKA Lori Noreen Daybell, on or between the 8th day of September 2019 and the 18th day of February 2020 in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did desert a child under the age of 18 to wit, TR. 
with a date of birth of 9-24-2002, who was dependent on the defendant for care, education, or support with the intent to abandon TR. Ms. Daybell, do you understand what's been charged in count two as well as the maximum penalties? Ms. Daybell, count three is a misdemeanor under Idaho law. It's the charge of resisting and or obstructing an officer, a violation of Idaho code 18-705. It's punishable by up to one year in the county jail and up to a $1,000 fine. It alleges that the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, AKA Lori Noreen Daybell, on or about the 26th day of November, 2019 in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did willfully delay and or obstruct a public officer to wit Lieutenant Ron Ball of the Rexburg Police Department in the discharge of his office by giving false information regarding the whereabouts of a child, JV, date of birth 5-25-2012, and thereby delaying the search for JV. Ms. Daybell, do you understand the charge in count three as well as the maximum penalties? Count four is also a misdemeanor. It's a charge of solicitation. It carries with it up to six months in the county jail and a one thousand, or excuse me, a five hundred dollar fine. It's a violation of Idaho Code eighteen two zero zero one. It alleges that the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, A.K.A. Lori Noreen Daybell, on or about the twenty sixth day of November two thousand nineteen, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho with the purpose of promoting or facilitating the commission of a crime encouraged and or requested Melanie Gibb to engage in conduct which would constitute the crime of resisting and or obstructing an officer by requesting and or encouraging Melanie Gibb to give false information to law enforcement regarding the whereabouts of a child, JV, date of birth 5-25-2012, Ms. Daybell, you understand the charge of count four as well as the maximum penalty? Yes. The last count is count five. It's a misdemeanor under Idaho law. It's a charge of contempt, a violation of Idaho Code 18 1801, subsection four. It's punishable by up to six months in the county jail and up to a $1,000 fine. It alleges that the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, AKA Lori Noreen Daybell, on or about the 30th day of January, 2020, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did willfully disobey a lawful court order in Madison County, case number CV 3320-45, by failing to physically produce minor children JV and TR to the Rexburg Police Department and or Idaho Department of Health and Welfare within five days of service of the order. Ms. Daybell, do you understand what's been alleged in count five as well as the maximum penalty? I understand. Ms. Daybell, do you understand that all of those charges and their maximum penalties could run consecutively one after the other, or they could run concurrently, meaning at the same time? You understand that? Yes. In addition to the rights form that you've already filled out, Pursuant to Idaho Criminal Rule 5, I'm also going to give you the following rights. Number one, uh, you are not required to make a statement and that any statement made by you today can be used against you in court. Number two, you're entitled to know the nature of the charges that have been brought against you, which we've already gone through. Number three, you uh, are entitled to bail. You have a right to bail. Number four, you have the right to be uh, represented by counsel. Number five, uh, you have a right to a preliminary hearing. Uh, that preliminary hearing must be set within 14 days if you're incarcerated. It can be set within 21 days if you're not incarcerated. That preliminary hearing is a probable cause hearing where the state will have the burden of showing probable cause that the two felonies have been committed um, in order for you to be bound over to the district court. You also have the right to communicate with counsel and immediate family. Uh, and that, that reasonable means will be provided for you to do so. Do you understand those legal rights, Ms. Daybell? All right, Ms. Daybell, uh, now we'll schedule the preliminary hearing. Uh, I've met with counsel in chambers prior to coming out here, and there's a few dates that I believe did work. Uh, Mr. Wood, on behalf of the state, 
uh, you designated that the state needs approximately two weeks to be ready, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And you also designated that the state needed two days uh, for the preliminary hearing to take place, is that correct? Yes. Uh, does the defense want to comment as far as uh, how much time they need to, to uh, be ready as well as how much time the preliminary hearing will take? Your Honor, I think um, two weeks is more than sufficient and I agree with the proposed two-day setting. Okay. All right, the court has available March 18th and 19th. Does that work for counsel for the defense? We'll make it work, Your Honor. It does, Your Honor. Your Honor, the state may have an issue getting one of our witnesses over here from Hawaii um, on the 18th. Uh, we had asked previously that it be set for the 19th and 20th and we continue, continue that request. Mr. Wood, if we uh, made some arrangements so that if your witness could only be here by the 19th, that we allowed that witness to, to testify on the 19th, would that appease your concern? Yes, Your Honor. Does the defense have any objection to that, to moving things around a little bit so that that witness can testify on the 19th and not on the 18th? No, Your Honor. All right, we'll schedule then the preliminary hearing for March 18th and 19th here at the Madison County Courthouse. We'll schedule that right at 9 a.m. Uh, the court notes that there was a motion for a bond reduction uh, that was filed by the defense in this matter approximately two days ago. Has the prosecution received a copy of that motion to reduce bond? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Wood, is the prosecution objecting to that being heard here today? No, you're not. No, we're not, Your Honor. All right. We'll hear the motion to reduce bond then today. Uh, Ms. Elcox, are you going to be arguing that? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed with your argument. I want you to know that I have reviewed your motion. I've also reviewed uh, Title 19, Chapter 29, and Idaho Rule, Criminal Rule 46. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, we are asking that the court today set bail in the amount of $10,000 consistent with what Lori's attorney in Hawaii requested. Um, in the event that the court is not inclined to set bond in the amount of $10,000, we are asking that the court consider setting a bond no higher than $50,000 in this case. Lori is presumed innocent as she stands before the court today. The fact that she is presumed innocent is not a loose guideline. It's a foundational principle of the American criminal justice system. Under both uh, the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution and Article I, Section 6 of the Idaho Constitution, excessive bail is prohibited. Judge, you are the gatekeeper in this case. You're the guardian of the presumption of innocence and the constitutional rights afforded to Lori. This is not a court of public opinion. This is a court of law. And are we going to let our citizens', citizens rights be dictated by what appears in the media? Bail must be set in an amount that assures Lori's appearance in court and is commiserate with the charges that she is actually facing today in court. A $5 million bond is unreasonable, it's astronomically excessive, and is the functional equivalent of holding Lori without bond. This is a violation of Lori's constitutional rights. I can tell the court that in my almost decade of practicing law as both a prosecutor and a defense attorney, I have never seen the crime of desertion charged. This is because abandonment issues are generally dealt with under the Child Protection Act, not the criminal code. But even under the desertion criminal statute, which Lori has been charged with and faces these charges here today, the maximum fine, as Your Honor uh, said today in court, that can be ordered is $500. Yet her fine, or excuse me, her bail is set at $5 million, 10,000 times the maximum fine in this case. In a recent Madison County murder case, the bond was set at $1 million. In the five counts the court read today, charged in the criminal case, there is not one allegation of a crime of violence. A bond set this high denies Lori due process and fundamentally deprives her of her ability to meaningfully participate in the defense of these allegations she faces. It is clear that the government just needed to find a charge 
that would fit in this case because of all of the media attention surrounding this matter. The last thing that should happen is to allow this case to be tried in the media and to allow public opinion and rampant speculation to dictate how this case proceeds through the judicial system. Considering the purpose of, purpose of bail to which Lori is entitled as a matter of right, Idaho Criminal Rule 46, as your honor reference, lists the factors that the court should consider when determining the appropriate bail amount to set in this case. Pursuant to those factors, Lori's bond should simply be reduced in the amount requested because she has no criminal history whatsoever. In fact, Lori took the initiative while she was in Hawaii to contact law enforcement and say in the event that a warrant issues, she will voluntarily turn herself in. Police did not afford her that opportunity to do, to do so. They created a spectacle out of the situation when they knew that Lori had contacted law enforcement and indicated that she would turn herself in. She waived extradition in this case. She did not fight returning to Idaho. She has hired three criminal defense attorneys from two different law firms, and she is dedicated to vigorously defending against these allegations. We, as her attorneys, also agree to assure Lori's presence in court. Chad, Lori's husband, has returned to Idaho, to his home of his own volition, and Lori and Chad maintain a residence locally. That home was purchased over five years ago, or approximately five years ago. Chad, their children, their children's spouses, and grandchildren are all located locally. Furthermore, Lori's passport is expired. She is no flight risk whatsoever, and this assertion that when this investigation began, when there was initial law enforcement contact, that she fled to Hawaii is unequivocally false. That was a planned move. We believe that the evidence will show that, will establish that. It was a planned move to a place that she had previously lived, and she moved to the exact same neighborhood in which she pre previously resided. Furthermore, Lori's history demonstrates that she has a consistency in her residence. She lived in Austin, Texas for almost 20 years, worked at the same salon for 15 years. She then moved to Chandler, Arizona, where she resided for five years in the same house. She worked as the director for Broadway Kids, an organization that puts on summer camps for children, and she also taught group fitness. Between 2014 and 2018, she lived in Kauai until she returned there this fall. Lori's history demonstrates that she has consistent, long-term residence and a long-term employment in those places that she's lived. Further, Your Honor, there is probably no greater assurance that, the, that Lori will appear before this court and any other court assigned to preside over this case because of the droves of people that she has following her every move, even before she was charged. She has TV cameras in her face. She has people following her. It is built-in pretrial monitoring to a level I have never seen before. It's more effective than any sort of surveillance that law enforcement could put on her. She cannot go anywhere without cameras and people scrutinizing her every single move. She poses no flight risk whatsoever. She is intent on defending against these allegations and proving that she is innocent, despite the fact it's the state's burden to prove her guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If the intent of the, the high bond as originally set in this case was to ensure that Lori was transported back to Idaho, she is back. And as I stated, she is eager to defend against these charges. Regardless as to whether she has been tried and convicted in the court of public opinion, Your Honor, here today, Lori is innocent. Lori will absolutely abide by any pretrial release conditions, any sort of monitoring that the court requires, but there is simply no basis for a bond this high, and it must be reduced given the charges that she is facing. For those reasons, Your Honor, we would ask that you grant the defendant's request to reduce bond. Ms. Cox, just so I'm clear, uh, if your client were to, to bond out, I, I don't need her address, but where would be her 
expected place of residence be? She'll be residing locally, Your Honor. I can provide that address to the court under seal if the court would like to do so. But given the uh, media attention, I would rather not put that on the record. I understand. Thank you. Mr. Wood, do you wish to be heard? Yes, Your Honor. I'll address counsel's uh, comments first um, on how we got here and, and why the bond or the bill was set at what it's at. Um, this case didn't start as a criminal case, Your Honor. It started as a report of two missing children who were still missing. Um, November 25th, Rexburg Police, late in the day, get noticed that this young child is missing. Within 24 hours, they respond. When they respond, they're given verifiably false information by the defendant. And so the next, uh, so the next day they obtain warrants and at that, to, to search the residence for the child. And at that point, uh, the defendant is gone. Now they say it's a planned move. Maybe they did plan to move to Hawaii. However, they clearly left very quickly as soon as they were contacted by law enforcement. The vast majority of their belongings are still in that apartment. And so uh, the investigation continued. A Child Protection Act was filed, and an order was given for Lori to produce the children, for the defendant to produce the children, which she did not do. Uh, I'll address this issue that, that she, she informed law enforcement that she would turn herself in. It's kind of hard to trust someone to turn themselves in on a warrant when a simple welfare check caused that person to leave. Uh, Your Honor, as counsel stated, uh, Idaho Criminal Rule 46 lists the factors to be considered at setting bail. So we'll, we'll go th down through those. Uh, defendant's employment status and history, uh, as far as we're aware, she's not presently employed. No argument can be made that she's at a risk of losing employment or financial condition. We are aware that the defendant's new husband received a substantial sum of life insurance proceeds from the death of his wife last October. Obviously, those funds provide them with the ability to relocate quickly and to stay away from Idaho, which we believe they've already done. Uh, the nature and extent of the defendant's family relationships. Uh, the defendant's only family here is her new husband. Uh, and it's important for the court to consider that at a bail reduction hearing in Hawaii, very recently, the defendant's attorney represented to the court that her husband lived in Hawaii, not in Idaho. Now, we understand that the defendant does have a house here, uh, close to here. However, the fact that he re that the that the defendant represented to a Hawaii court that they lived in Hawaii shows that they consider their ties not in Idaho but in Hawaii. And in terms of her past residences, uh, if we go back to the last uh, the last year, it gets a little more concerning. Uh, in regards to, uh, since this last summer, the defendant has lived in Arizona, Idaho, and Hawaii. And quite frankly, the circumstances, under, un, the circumstances under which she left Arizona, which was soon after the killing of her estranged husband by her brother, and the circumstances in which she left Idaho, which was the same night Rexburg police did a welfare check on her, give the state serious concern that she is a flight risk. Uh, factor four is the defendant's character and reputation. Since this last summer, there has been a clear and alarming pattern in the defendant's life. There are literally three active investigations of suspicious deaths that she is related to. And I want to be clear, Your Honor, we're not saying she's been charged in those. And we're not saying the court should treat her as such. However, she is related to each of those deaths, and it is alarming to the state. As we've said before, Your Honor, the defendant, has, the defendant tried to mislead Rexburg law enforcement about the whereabouts of her children. In furtherance of that, she tried to convince a family friend to tell the Rexburg police that the children were with her in Arizona, even though they weren't. And that, Your Honor, the defendant has a history of defying court orders. In the child protection case associated with this case, she refused to produce her children as ordered. In a 2009 child custody case in Travis County, Texas, the defendant was found guilty of seven different counts of civil contempt. Factor five, the persons who agreed to assist the defendant in attending the court at the proper time. Again, Your Honor, uh, that's pretty much limited to her new husband. And um, due to the fact that he and the defendant left so abruptly before, we don't uh, have a lot of assurance from that. Factor six, the nature of the current car charge and any mitigating or aggravating factors. 
that may bear on the likelihood of conviction and the possible penalty. In regard to those factors, Your Honor, the state would first point out the language of Idaho Code 18401, which states that it is a felony for anyone having a child under the age of 18 years dependent upon him or her for care, education, or support who deserts such child in any manner whatever with intent to abandon it is a felony. In any manner whatever. That's a broad statute, Your Honor. It's broad because it, it deals with protecting children. So the aggravating factors bearing on the likelihood of conviction in this case include the following. That the defendant established a residence in Madison County, Idaho with two minor children. Those children ended up being reported as missing and the defendant left the state without them. The defendant defied a court order to produce those children. One of those minor children is only seven years old and has special needs which require medication and medical attention. Both of the minor children received social security benefits and the defendant continued collecting the children's social security benefits into her own account, uh, both after the last known sightings of the children in Madison County and continuing into Hawaii. And it's important to note that, note that case law related to the desertion of a minor child and Idaho Code 19302 make it clear that this court has jurisdiction over acts of desertion both in here in Madison County and continuing into, uh, into Hawaii. And the most aggravating factor, Your Honor, uh, one that's quite frankly heartbreaking and is the reason why there's so much media attention is that the children are still missing and the defendant has not only misled law enforcement in their efforts to find the children but she has completely and utterly refused to aid in any attempts to find the children even before charges were filed. Another factor bearing on the likelihood of conviction is the Idaho Code 18403 and 18405 and case law related to the statute under which she was charged make it clear that proving abandonment or desertion is prima facie evidence that the desertion was willful, which makes it easier for the state to obtain a conviction. In regards to the sentence, should the defendant be convicted, and we believe she will, the defendant could face up to 30 years in prison, which is certainly motive to flee. As far as the defendant's prior criminal record, Your Honor, uh, as we aren't aware of any criminal history. However, as we discussed earlier, she does have a history of defying court orders. Um, any factor number eight, any facts indicating the possibility of violations of law if the defendant is released without restrictions. And Your Honor, we would just say past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. Uh, she's already disobeyed this court's order. Um, and so we have no reason to believe that if she were released that she wouldn't continue an unlawful behavior. Factor nine, any other facts tending to indicate that the defendant has strong ties to the community and is not likely to flee the jurisdiction. At this point, Your Honor, with her two children missing, the defendant's only local tie is her husband, who again, as of a couple of weeks ago, claimed that she claimed that he lived in Hawaii. Um, factor 10, what reasonable restrictions, conditions, and prohibitions should be placed on the defendant's activities, movements, associations, associations and residences? Your Honor, should be, the bell be lowered or should the defendant be able to make bell? We would ask for the following restrictions. That she be limited to living in Madison or Fremont County, Idaho that she'd be required to wear some sort of GPS location device, and we're aware that uh, those can be obtained from a bondsman. Um, and that the, that the defendant, if she does have a passport, that she surrender it to the court. In conclusion, Your Honor, the defendant has established through her own behavior that she cannot be trusted to obey a court order or to appear at future court hearings. The state believes that Bell should be confirmed where it is. We have no confidence that the defendant will stay in the area and appear for future hearings should she be released. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Ms. Elcox, this is your motion. I'll give you the last word if you'd like it. Thank you, Your Honor. As I indicated, Lori is more than willing to abide by any restriction that the court puts on her if, if uh, the court so chooses to do so. Uh, the prosecutor stated that uh, past behavior is essentially pre the best predictor of future behavior. I would point to the fact that Lori, in, in all of the decades that she has been alive does not have a single criminal law violation whatsoever. It goes without saying that she also does not have any failure to appear in any criminal case. Um, the prosecutor referenced the specific code language that she is charged with. I would note that this statute doesn't have a definition for abandon. However, the Child Protective Act does. And in that 
In those statutes, the prima facie evidence of abandonment is established when there hasn't been a, um, the parental relationship hasn't been maintained for a year. Pursuant to the charging language and the time period that the state chose to charge in this case, Lori isn't even at half that time. So I respectfully disagree with the prosecutor's uh, assertion that Lori will be convicted of these charges. I have represented to the court, as, a, as I have a duty of candor to the tribunal, that Lori will be residing locally. And as I indicated, I'm happy to provide that address to your honor um, under seal to protect Lori in this case. She, the prosecutor, has gone through a litany of allegations for which she is not facing any sort of criminal charges whatsoever and not criminal charges in this case. Those should not be considered by the court for purposes of this case and setting bond pursuant to Idaho, uh, the factors listed in Idaho Criminal Rule 46. We would ask that you, you grant um, the defendant's request and set bail as requested in this matter. Thank you, Ms. Alcox. Court has listened carefully to the argument of both the state and the defense. The court has reviewed in detail and in full Rule 46 of the Idaho Criminal Rules. The court has also uh, reviewed the Idaho Bail Act, Title 19, Chapter 29, specifically under 192904. It designates that the court may release a person on his own recognizance or set an amount of bail and may impose any conditions of release. In making these determinations, the court shall consider the following objectives. Number one, ensuring the appearance of the defendant. Number two, ensuring the integrity of the court process, including the right of the defendant to bail as constitutionally provided. Number three, ensuring the protection of victims and witnesses. And number four, ensuring public safety. The court has taken all four of those factors into consideration as well as all 10 factors in under subsection C under the Idaho Criminal Rules 46. And based upon the argument that I've heard here today, the court is going to reduce bail. Uh, I'm going to reduce bail to the amount of $1 million. I recognize all of the factors that have been looked at here. One specific thing that uh, the court notes in setting such a high uh, bail amount is that there is a pending court order and to my knowledge there has been nothing set forth uh, regarding uh, obedience to that court order uh, pertaining to uh, lining the court out with information on where the two children are at the Department of Health and Welfare or at the Rexburg Police Department. So with that, bail will be set at $1 million. If bail is posted, there will also be the following conditions that are ordered. Number one, there will need to be a waiver of extradition signed from any and all jurisdictions to be brought back here before the court. Number two, uh, I'm going to require that Ms. Daybell not leave Bonneville, Jefferson, Madison, and Fremont counties. If she were to leave any of those counties uh, while this case is pending without permission or authorization from the court, that would be a violation of the terms of bond and release. Uh, I'm also going to order that there be an ankle monitor that is placed on the defendant. Uh, that will need to be all lined out before she's eligible to bail out. Uh, it will be monitoring 24 hours a day, seven days a week as to where uh, the defendant is. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to order as a term of any release or bail that the defendant appear for all court appearances, that she maintain contact with her counsel, um, and that she abide by all the laws of this state, this country, this county, and this city. Mr. Wood, do you have any uh, questions about my ruling regarding the reduction of that bail? No, Your Honor. Ms. Elcox. Just briefly, Your Honor, does the court have a specific form for the waiver of extradition you would like us to use? Uh, I think the jail has one. Does the jail have a form that they have? If you'll communicate with the, uh, the sure. jail, I think they do have a form. If not, why don't you submit the one after you've gotten approval from Mr. Wood? Um, uh, 
you can submit that after she signed it and the court will review to make sure it meets my satisfaction. Yes, Your Honor. And do you have, uh, would you like us to coordinate setting up the ankle monitor through the jail or do you have a specific agency you would like us to use? You can coordinate with the jail and or the sheriff's office. Um, they'll know that information. They may have someone that they usually use. I'm not sure of that. Um, if you have a preference, you could provide that information to them. And if there's an issue, it can be brought before me for thank my you, approval. Honor. Any other questions? No, thank you. All right. I believe that takes care of everything uh, that we're here for today. Um, in a moment, I'm going to leave. Um, when I do that, uh, the audience is going to be asked to rise. I'm going to leave the courtroom. After I leave, I'm instructing everybody to be seated again. Uh, there will be the removal of the defendant from the courtroom, and then everybody will be excused row by row pursuant to court personnel here today. With that, we'll be in recess. All rise.